governed by a certain number of couples. And how do I, why do I need a statement of couples? Before I go into that, if I ask everyone here, how many of you do you really, really desire to win a scholarship award? I'm sure it's everyone. Do we have answer? Yes, I, I desire to win one more scholarship. <laughs> okay. So everybody wants scholarship and that is why we are here. But how many of us really, really, oh, you is, it, is another thing when you want something, you need something, but it's another thing for you to deserve it. Lazy students don't get scholarship. So I always tell my students, when you're writing your statement of purpose for this, I may call it SOP, but anywhere, anytime you hear SOP is statement of purpose and or personal statement, depending on uh, whatever it is. So if you're writing your SOP, please, you cannot afford to be lazy with it. That's my number one rule. Do not be lazy. So if you're not lazy with your SOP, you, you will be able to devote all the time that is required in developing a very fantastic statement of purpose because it's part of the same way you develop, uh, just, sorry, the same way you, you develop, devote time for reading, you know, to get your degree, to budge your first class, to budge your two one, to budge your second class or lower or whatever it is. It's the same way you should devote a lot of time in developing your statement of purpose because it forms part of your assessment as a student, especially if you're looking at applying for a scholarship. Because you should know that this scholarship we're talking about is highly competitive. For instance, Ulster University have a scholarship we call Great Scholarship Award. This Great Scholarship Award is for Ghanaians and some other countries. And it's just one, it's in collaboration with British Council, and it is just one person. And every year we receive a lot of applications. So out of all those applications, we need to like select one particular one that stands out. So what you need to do to make your own statement of purpose stand out and attract the reader. Meanwhile, you have to put it at the back of your mind that this same person that is going through my statement of purpose, I've gone through maybe another 50 for that day. They've gone through another 30 or another 20 applications. So what makes you stand out? What, what, uh, what really makes them, you know, what creates that interest or arouse that interest in towards you by the reader? So that is why I said you cannot afford to be lazy when you're developing your statement of purpose. You need to devote time. You need to, to be very, very serious about it. And please do not outsource your statement of purpose to an agent. It is unethical for any agent to write statement of purpose for anyone. I'll get to it. Please, it is, there's a reason they call it personal statement. It is personal. It's your own personal experience. It's about you. It's a way of selling yourself to the university where they should give you that scholarship award, where they should give you that program. It's a personal statement. It's a statement of purpose, your own purpose, my own purpose, the purpose of your study, the purpose of your career. So we need to have all that at the back of your mind. And please do not be vague. Statement of purpose is an essay. It is not a question and answer thing. It's an essay. So when you're writing this essay, have it at the back of your mind that you're writing at least a minimum of 500 words. Ideally, you should have 500 to 1,000. So you can use your one ca word counter, you know, to count as you write it, you know. And then I will break it into segments to make it very easy. And like I said, I'm going to give you acronyms to follow, you know, when developing your statement of purpose. Please, a minimum of 500 to 1,000 words is what you need. And please do not outsource. Don't be vague. Be realistic. And do not lie. You know? Okay, so what is statement of purpose? I'm not going to go into uh, dictionary uh, definition or one definition. I'll just put it in my own word, what I understand by statement of purpose. And just the idea, please highlight the key words you will, as you listen. I said a statement of purpose is an essay, often attached to an academic application to describe the candidates. And that is why I said it is personal. You are describing yourself. Nobody knows you better than yourself. 
So you are describing yourself, you are describing the candidates to us. Admissions don't even know you. They are only seeing your application. So you are selling yourself to them. You are not selling your CV because CV is part of the requirement for application. So you are not going to give us everything you have on your CV because we have your CV already. So what you are going to tell us is just things about yourself. And when you ask people to tell them about yourself, then they start telling you, oh, I'm the firstborn of my family. My father is from um, Accra. My mother is from Kumasi. They got married in 1954. Their marriage is blessed with two children. Our, our firstborn was, was born in the year. And then before we could open our eyes and close it, we have our second born. And we don't need all, all those stories. They are not relevant. So what I'm trying to say is when you're writing, even though you're trying to introduce yourself as a candidate, introduce yourself with relevant information, relevant to your application. Introduce yourself with your interests, your academic background, your skills. You know, those are the important things. Your experiences. When I say experiences could be uh, maybe work experience, it could be um, a volunteer work, you know, whatever it is that you have. So some people will say, oh, I just graduated, I don't have any experience. You should have, you have something. Even as a student union governor or as a member of student union government of your university or of your fellowship or whatever, there are some skills you have learned, leadership skills. So those are the things you need to tell us about your uh, when you are introducing yourself and not all those irrelevant things about your family background, what you had last night and all of that. They are not relevant. Okay, so I go to your future career plan. It's part of the things we need to see. Those are the highlights. Those are the highlights of your personal statement. If not specified, write at least 500 words, like I said. Bear in mind where you are writing. You should know why you are writing. I'm writing because I want to stand out in the mind of my, of my reader, of my, as whoever is assessing it, maybe an admission officer or the head of admission or even the academics sometimes, you know. So you need to like stand out by putting all those things together in a very good way that we attract your reader. While you are writing and then you need to impact value. What do I mean by that? The same value you impact, I, I think I've said that before, the same value you impact on your studies, you know, to have your 2-1, your first class, is the same value you should, uh, 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 sorry, impact on your SOP. So I've divided, like I said, it's just summary that I'm bringing to you. So I've dis divided this into three segments. The three segments or the three steps or the three uh, steps to follow when you are writing your statement of purpose, right? When you're writing your statement of purpose, you need just three steps. You know, that's the summary of the whole thing. Step one, I call, I, I, the acronym I'm giving to these three steps is O. You owe it to yourself to write a fantastic personal statement. What do I mean by O? O-W-E. Just like you're owing a debt, you're owing someone, you know. O, O-W-E. What does the O stand for? The O stand for outlining. You know, you are, you, are, you are trying to outline all the things you need to write, all the ideas, you know, putting your ideas together. In a jotter, you can just scribble them. O. So that is the O. Under the O, you are outlining. Before I leave that, uh, that, uh, that particular step, I've divided the O into three again. You think I like three, don't mind me. The old thing, the old personal statement is in three segments. I call it O-W-E, outlining, and then the W is to write. Then you go into the real writing. And then the E is for you to go through, to edit, to proofread. At this stage, at the E stage, you can actually do that yourself. Or if you know someone that can, like I said, it is just for the person to help you proofread. The person is not writing for you. You have done a very good job. You've taken time to apply your points. You have taken time to write. You just need somebody that is higher because you are the one that wrote it. So you might have oversight. 
there might be oversight on one or two things. But if you give it to somebody, a superior, somebody that writes better, you know, whether we like it or not, some people are more talented in some areas. You have your own strength. I have my own strength. Maybe mine is to talk and talk and talk. I can talk even when there's nobody around. I can be talking to myself. I'm comfortable like that. You know, but some people are very good writers. So you can actually ask them to edit, read for you. Oh, this is what I've written. Please, can you let me go through? Please, we all know what we call plagiarism. Do not copy anything without reference. It is very, very important because every work will be tested. Every personal statement you submit will be tested for plagiarism. So it is very, very important that you don't copy anything from anyone. Like I said, it's personal. And if you are copying, if you want to copy anything, maybe a saying or something, you need to let us know where you are taking it from. You need to make a reference to the source of that information. Okay, so let me go back. I've, I've told us about what O, uh, o means, O outlining, W is writing, and then E is to edit, to proofread. So let me go back to my first point, outlining. What am I outlining? I said I've divided that into three again. The first part of outlining is to introduce. Introduce yourself. And under this introduction, like I said, tell us about your academic background, your interests, professional experiences, your skills. Skills could be soft skills. It could be any form of skill. Your personal experience. And please, under this introduction, when you are introducing your personal statements, you need to use something catchy. It could be an adage. One thing I notice with my experience in this field is that most people from Africa, I don't know where we got that idea from, but everybody starts the same way. Right from childhood, everybody, nobody developed that idea along the line, maybe they walk somewhere and then they see that, oh, there's something I can, I, I can actually do. Everybody has that idea, that uh, skill, whatever it is, the career has been developed from childhood. I don't know why we got that idea. It is a very, very wrong motive, especially if it is not true. Somebody like me, if I want to write a personal statement, there is no way I will tell you that, oh, right from childhood is a lie. Because whatever will make me write a personal statement now did not start from childhood. It actually started when I joined this industry. So if I tell you, if they ask me right from childhood, then I'll be talking about medicine to be a medical doctor. You know, I'll take people's uh, stero stereoscope. I'll go to the hospital, go and sit with my doctor, you know, with gist and all of that. That is right from childhood. But whatever I want to do now as a career is not from childhood. So if it's not from childhood, you don't have to go that route. Like I said, when you are introducing, talk about your professional experience, your interests, your skills, academic background. You can briefly tell us about your family background if it's relevant. Then your work experience is very important and all those skills you have. And please, start with something catchy that we, you know, sometimes you are reading and you are tired. But somebody will just say something and will be like, your eyes will just be open like, oh, what? What's this person talking about? You will, that interest will just come from nowhere. Because... The person introduced did a very good introduction introduction by putting a catchy introductory line. So do something catchy. It could be a story, a very short story. When I say a story, it doesn't have to be lengthy. It could be something just very brief. It could be a very short story. It could be you know something that motivated you into pursuing that career or that uh, academic career or whatever it is that you you really want to do with that uh, with that program. So please. That is how to introduce, like I said, I'll take that again. Brief, let it be very unique and personal to you. Your introduction should be very unique. You know, it should be very personal. It should be catchy, attractive. It could be anything. But there is no rule that says we must start from right from childhood or as, uh, from a younger age or as I was growing up. No, there's no rule that says we should or we must start that way. You know, do something different. Make your own unique. You know, so the next one is the body. When you have dealt, like I said, you have, you don't, you've not started writing. You're just jotting, you know, scribbling things down, the points, outlining. So after the introduction, you have outlined your introduction. Then you go to the body of your writing. And then under the body, the university wants to, like the 
my previous uh, presenter said, the university wants to be sure that out of over a hundred university in the UK, you have actually done your research. It is not your friend that says, come to Ulster University. It is not your cousin that says, oh, Ulster is the best for you. Or it is not just because your agent said, oh, it's only Ulster I have on my list of partners, so you must go to Ulster. No agent should go up a university down your throat without you researching. So you must do your own personal research about the university you want to uh, attend. So go to the websites. How do you, how do you, is that a crime that you have uh, maybe uh, referrals, you know, somebody is telling you about the university, maybe past students, alumni, friends, family, somebody, someone based in the UK and all of that. It's not a crime, it's good. But what I'm trying to say is, even when they do that, you still need to do your own research. Because why I'm telling you that this is the best university for you, you might, during your research, you might find out that, oh, there's actually a better one that I may not know about. So you need to do your research. And how do you do that? You can talk to the current students of the university, but the most important is for you to go to the website of the university. Like, I was, sorry, I'll be talking about Ulster so much. I hope you don't mind. That, that is the one I know. So for Ulster now, if you go to our website and then you type, let's assume you want to study MBA, and you type MBA on your course search, it will take you to the MBA page, full-time, you will see full-time, part-time, you click on full-time MBA, and then the year, the year is important. Oh, I'm looking at 2024, 2024, 2025. Click on that. On that same page, you will see on the left-hand side where you have the summary of the program you want to, you, you want to study, the modules, the modules are the course outline. What am I going to be studying? What are the topics? So you have your modules, you have your career opportunities, the, the students, the previous students that graduated from this course, where and where are they working? And to crown it all, you even have the opportunity to listen to videos. You know, somebody speaking, it could be the head of department, we call them course director, it could be the course director, you know, speaking about the course, it could be one of the students, you know, telling you about the course, it could be a combination of both or more. So you can actually listen to them, you know, click on the video, listen to them, read about the accommodation of the university, read about your course, be vast, not everything about it, like you're already there. And for most universities, they even have virtual tour on their website. So you can actually do a virtual tour on the website of the university to know where the, you need to know where your campus is. Okay, so yeah, like my own university now, we have, although the main campus of the university is in Northern Ireland, even though we are in Northern Ireland, we still have campuses like three places in Northern Ireland, depending on your course. So you need to know where your primary course of study is. It could be UK, it could be outside UK, whatever it is, even if you're applying to an American university, an Australian university, whichever is still the same. You need to know your primary course of uh, place of study. So if you are coming for MBA at Ulster University, you know that you'll be in Belfast. If it's not any of our satellite campuses, if you are coming for something related to life and health sciences, most likely you either be in Megi or in our current campus. So you need to know all those information. It's very important. So you need to know your destination first. Oh, is it America? Is it Qatar? Is it Dubai? Is it UK? It's, you know, you need to know the destination, and then you need to know your primary um, location of your for your course for your program. Is it the main campus? Is it one of the satellite campuses or out? You know, you need to know where exactly precisely your your primary site uh, site of study is located. And then, why this particular university? Why Ulster? Most universities do that. You know, they tell you, oh. Studying MBA at Osa University will give you this and this and that. So that is why you are choosing Osta. So you need to know why you are choosing that particular university. That is why I discourage student writing and open, you know, it's part of laziness that you just write one, one SOP and you want to submit it for 20 universities. Because each of these universities have their own uniqueness. They have their own unique selling points. And one is better than the other for one program or the other. So you need to know what uh, suits you in terms of uh, the course you're going for, 
in terms of tuition, you know, there are so many factors to put into consideration. How much is their tuition? Where is the location? You know, so many things. Uh, what are the students saying about them? You know, and thank God there are a lot of uh, Ghanaian students, even on campus and all of that. So you can actually reach out to some of them. But like I said, the most important is to, for you to do it. Do your own personal research through the website. So why this university and not the other one? It's very important you know why you're coming to this university and not because my agent, my agent said, or my friend said, it's good that somebody is referring you, but like I said, it's better you, you have research and you know why you are choosing that particular university for your program. Then why, why this particular course? Why MBA? Why not international business? Why not, um, why not uh, social works? Why not social policy? Why not, there are lots of them. Why not business development and innovation? Why not corporate governance? There are lots of courses. So why do you want to study this particular one? And when you are talking about why you want to study this course, you need to align it with your past work and life experience, your current situation, and your future career plan. So when you are writing why this course, I always tell students, marry the three together. I'm saying three again, don't mind me. There are a lot of threes in this presentation. So you need to marry your past, your present, to the future. When you are writing why you want to go, because you cannot exonerate your present without talking about your past. And then why do you want to now go to this particular one? That's the future. What's your future career plan? You need to talk about that as well. And um, how does this course align with your future career plan? How does it align? I've seen situation whereby student with just here is very common. It's popular everywhere, especially in Africa. The student with just here, you know what is selling in the UK now? It's nothing. Somebody will just study communication. In fact, okay, so I've seen a medical doctor. I am not lying and I'm not trying to be funny. I've seen a medical doctor come to me and say, seems okay, I want to go to the UK to study nursing. Yes. He said that because he has heard so many people talking about nursing. A medical doctor wanted to go and study nursing. So he said that because there have heard so many people talking about nursing, it's nursing, if it's nursing, see, I'm in this industry. I know it. If I'm going to the UK to study now, it can never be nursing. The truth is, how do you think, when it comes to health, you know how we place health as in, 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 in developed world, in Western world, and then you think you will just do one one year nursing program and then they give you injection to stop injecting everybody. It's not going to happen. Do you understand? So it's always better. You, it's good to listen to people, to hear the ideas from here and there. But when it comes to making a decision, you need to be realistic with your decision so that you don't end up frustrated. Oh, at a point because of COVID, there were conversion nursing programs and all of that. But how realistic for you and I, you know, as an individual, some people will do it, they will like it. But I've seen some students that went for that and then they are now grumbling and saying, oh, because their expectation, they didn't manage their expectation. They were thinking immediately they finished that, their one year, one and a half year, two year nursing program. They give them injections to start choking everybody. No, it's not going to happen. So instead of that, they are more into nurse assistance, they are more into care and all of that. And that's it. So you need to be very realistic and, you know, with your expectation and manage your expectation in line with your career. It's not about what people are saying. It's about your own career. There is no, I tell people that there is nothing you do in life. You will succeed if you are determined. It's your determination. Irrespective of what you study. I am talking to you today, although I later did MBA, but I'm an agriculturist. I'm a farmer. I tell people I'm, I'm a farmer. Even though I've never done anything for me all my life, apart from when I was in school. But my farmer, it was after school, okay, like I said, I wanted to study medicine, and then I didn't meet the cutoff point for, for medicine. And in my school, the tradition is if you don't meet the cutoff point for medicine, they throw you into agriculture. So we, we all tell ourselves that, okay, after one year, studying at break will change to, to medicine or paramedical anatomy, physiology, but no way, they did not allow us. So I ended up graduating as a, as a farmer.
So I have a farmer. So it's not about time. He's good to study a very good program. But like I said, set yourself to your mind, your heart and everything to whatever you want to do. And whatever you have set your mind on, you will achieve. Some people will still study nursing and they will end up with depression, frustration and all of that. So it's not about what people are saying. You need to sit yourself down because it's a personal race. So like I said, why am I going for this course? When you are writing the body of your SOP. And then um, another one is, how does it align with my background? Because especially if you have academic gap, you've been out of the university for the past 10 years. You've been working in finance sector, maybe a bank banking industry and all of that, and all of a sudden, you just remember that, oh, it was agriculture I studied, though. Oh, okay. Let me now apply for MSc agronomy. You will need to justify why you have been away from agronomy or anything agronomy for the past 10 years, and then you want to come back. Like I tell students, when it comes to UKVI and justification for whatever you want to do at anywhere, not just UKVI. There is no yes or no answer. It depends on how you can defend yourself. And you have to be genuine because if you are lying, they will know. So you have to be original. So that's why I'm saying that when you are, when you are going for a course, it's not just because, you know, let it align with what you have been doing with your skills, with your experiences, with your, you know, all those things. Don't just come from anywhere and just say, oh, I want to do this and that's what I want to do. Without having a very good justification for it. Okay, so the last part of my O is the conclusion part. That is the last part. You know, I divided the O again into three, and that is the introduction, the introduction part, the body of the outline, and then the conclusion. How do you conclude your SOP? Always conclude your SOP with your future career plan mapped out. If I were in your shoes, I would even research on where I want to work. It does not mean that you must go there and work, you know, upon graduation, but that is your desire. You need to even know how much do they pay their average, average salary for their graduates. If you are putting all those information, I will know that you have done your research. Let us know what's the plan. Or is it because there is a popular slang in Nigeria now? I don't know if it's, you, if you Ghanaians understand it, they call it Japa. Yes, have you heard Japa. That you know, yes. there's Japa everywhere now. So do you want to just go and Japa? Or you have a career that you're trying to pursue and you have researched and you're so genuine with it. Even if you want to Japa, Japa with sense. <laughs> That's my own plan. <laughs> you know? So in your conclusion, please, please, and please put together your future career plan. Well detailed, you know, and thoroughly researched. Okay? So that is that about our first uh, step, which is step O, outlining. And then I go to the second step, which is writing. When you want to write, you have done the outline. It's just to, you have given the skeleton in your outline. So now it's to flesh it up. So when you get to the right, the step two, which is to write, to properly sit down and write, you now give flesh. You need to mind what you put in there, the information, not too much information, but don't be vague. So it must be done in moderacy. And when you are writing, please, please and please do not copy any work, you know, without reference. So all the three we have put together on that, oh, your introduction, the body, the conclusion, is all we are putting together now under our writing. And then the last step that I dwell so much on O because it's the main thing. If you get that all right, every other thing will be in place. So once you have done the O, then you write, you do the thorough writing. After writing, the first person to edit your work is you. Even if you are giving it to a friend that you think will write better to help you proofread or to a superior, to your line manager, to whoever you want to give, please. Go through it yourself before you give it to anyone. And that is the last step. Edit. Edit your work. Edit your essay. Do the word counts. 500 to 1,000 words. 
and then proofread generally. You can use anybody to do the proofreading for you. But like I said, do not contract your SOP. Don't contract it to your agent. Don't contract it to your friend. Don't contract it to machinery. There are some people who call machinery. They can do anything for anybody. So please don't contract it. Do it yourself. It's always better. It even gives you the confidence when you're talking about it. Maybe in class there is a presentation and all of that. You know, because you did it yourself, you'll be able to talk more with boldness. So I'll leave that as it may. That is all I'll say about your statement of purpose. And like I said, it's just going to be the summary. I, I don't want to take your old day. I know I've wasted so much time before I was able to join eventually. So going to the reference letters. Some universities actually have their own formats of writing their reference letter. You know, on their website, when you go there, they, they might have like a form. Let me see if I can use video. I don't, I'm just trying to test draw my video if it's not going to affect it. Okay, so some schools on their website, you might be able to actually see a form, a reference form that you can actually print out and send to your referee. And for some universities, all you need is just a letter. Please, whoever is writing, not even whoever, I'll give you two people that can write a reference letter for you, an academic reference letter for the purpose of application to a university. There are just two group of people that I think are ideal. The first group of people and your lecturers in your school, the ones that taught you. You will see some people, they went to Kumasi, NU. NUST. Yes. yes. And then, when they are bringing, they are bringing University of Ghana uh, reference letter. And you'll be like, what's the correlation? You've graduated from this school. Is that, is, does it mean that there's no lecturer in your school that can give you a reference letter? Why do you have to go to another university? You know, is it that you were bad in school that you don't want to get a reference letter from any of your lecturers? So you need to like get your lecturer to maybe one of them. It doesn't have to be two. At least a lecturer from your school. One, especially the one that taught you because they know you better. You know, they know you better and they, they actually can say one or two things about you academically, your skills, your personality, your interpersonal skills and all of that. So please, and endeavor to give it to them and do not outsource it like i said the other time don't outsource it to another lecturer because the lecturer attends your church or is an uncle no your academic reference should come from your university from one of your lecturers that taught you okay depending on the program you might submit two academic references especially if you have not been working if you are a fresh graduate I know this program is for young graduates, you know, the young graduates like we call ourselves. But in, in terms of uh, people that have worked maybe for some years, two years, a year, and all of that, you can actually get one academic reference or, and uh, sorry, at least it's not meant to be or, and a work reference. When you're getting your work reference, there's always a challenge. And the challenge is, how do I get a work reference from my line manager? Because I wouldn't want anybody in my organization to know that I'm planning to exit, to resign. Or I have this plan. What if the, the, the plan doesn't work out? They will be waiting for me to come and drop resignation letter and all of that. You know, I understand it very well. So what I tell people is, even before your graduation, you might have worked somewhere, maybe holiday job or whatever. So anybody that you have worked with, your line manager, your superior, can give you a reference letter. And um, please, either it's a reference letter from your from the academic person, from your lecturer, from your school, or a work reference. Either of them, any work ref any reference you are submitting, please ensure that it is on the official letter edge paper. With the official email, phone number, those are the highlights, email, phone number, and designation. If the person is the HOD, 
head of department, their name in full, their, their uh, email, phone number must be part of the information provided in case admissions wants to contact them. And like I said, when they are giving you reference data, please speak to them that they should not put their Gmail or their personal email, you know, yahoo.com, when there is or there are official email address. Is it at Edu? Is it at uh, KNUT? You know, whatever it is, let them use their official because this is actually for an official purpose. So it should be on the letterhead with their official email and phone number. No admission person will call somebody after work or outside the official hour. They won't call them 8 p.m. They won't call them 9 p.m. So there's no need of giving me your personal phone number because I won't call you at that time for anything official. I'll always call you during official hour, maybe 9 to 5, or send you an email, an official email, from my own official email to your own official email. So please. It's always very important. And please, when they're giving you, let it be that the person really know you. You have worked with the person, not just um, a church member, a friend, my boyfriend, you know, anybody. No. Your re reference letter must be from somebody you have worked with or somebody that taught you in school. If you are going for courses like MBA, please ensure you put your work reference. If you are going for MBA, ensure you put a work reference. If you have been out of school for some time, three years, four years, two years, please use an academic reference and a work reference. It's always better. Especially if you have changed job. So you can actually use your previous employer as your reference or as your referee. So you might not use the current employer because you don't want them to know that you're trying to jack back. But please, Get your previous employer to do it for you. It's that simple. If you follow all these guidelines, I'm very sure you will have a seamless application processing. And even admissions will be very happy to turn your offer. There are some times that students will submit this application and is either the documentation are not right or something is missing or the personal statement is, you know, something is just not right about the application, you know, and it affects the quality. And when the quality of your application is being affected, it will delay your turnaround time. It means that you will see some people, they submit application within two weeks, they've gotten an unconditional offer. Whereas some other people will submit and three months, you are still chasing them for one thing or, or even admission might you actually skip it and then go to the next person, send an email and they will not check their email. So if you follow all these guidelines, it will be very easy for you to get your application turnaround in a very short, within a very short time. Thank you very much. That will be all for now.